So it seems like what you're saying is the precious metals are acting stronger this time around. And I know we're at least very much seeing that in gold, where if you compare gold to the general equity market, I mean, the equity markets are down significantly for the year and gold is just down slightly. It is. And I mean, it's hard to make the case that, you know, he who loses least wins. But that's the case at this juncture. And I do believe, like in 2008, you will see a, a slingshot rebound where you see both the metals take off and uh, regain some traction. And then once new buying occurs, then we will see the metals start to make new highs. Will that happen by the end of this year? I don't know. I feel strongly that by two, in 2023, we will be seeing new highs in gold as a minimum, silver perhaps. But at the end game, uh, nothing outperforms silver. Will it happen this time or not? We'll see. What I do know is that uh, the st best study done on it was called Silver, the Restless Metal. Uh, Professor Jastrom, I've mentioned before, Elijah, and he did the golden constant. He looked at gold based on commodities and it did best in a deflation. And he wondered what silver did. So he looked at it under those same conditions and he determined that silver does sometimes well in deflation, sometimes not so well in deflation, but nothing beats it in an inflation. Now that book is several years old, published years ago, doesn't guarantee the future, but I certainly wouldn't be a seller at silver here. And one more comment on silver is that on the wholesale side, it's getting pretty tight. Now I don't talk to every wholesaler and every uh, refiner out there throughout Europe and um, you know the major dealers in the United States, but I still have a pretty good handle on it. And the market's price is not really reflective of how difficult it is to get metal in size. And last comment is they're moving physical silver, which I mean the commercial bars, from this continent to Europe. That doesn't take place unless there's a big need or demand for it. Because shipping silver, as you know, work with Miles Franklin, is not cheap. I mean, a bar weighs around seven pounds. So to ship a massive amount of those from across the ocean, that doesn't take place all the time. Usually what's in London stays in London and what's in New York stays in New York and they'll paper trade back and forth. But if you need the physical and you gotta put it on a boat and ship it, it's saying something. So let me finish there. Definitely, it does seem like, I mean, ever since the COVID crisis, really, we have seen a drawdown in supply. Do you see that? How do you see that playing out going forward if we do see a bottoming come in the next couple months for precious metals and then it take off again? Well, that's what I see, but it may be wishful thinking. I mean, I don't think the metals story is, for, is over by a long, long shot. I think there's a lot more to the story. I've said many times in broken record style, 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. And I think we're going to see something similar this time around. And I really anticipate that by 2024 or so, two years out, maybe two and a half, I think we're going to see you know, record highs in both the metals and a lot of people that will be joining the, the movement. The idea that, you know, stocks bad, gold good. And of course, that is not in the consciousness of most investors at this point in time, but it will happen in my study view. And I think when, hard to say, I think before the end of this year, you're going to see a lot more and uh, a lot more volume in the gold and silver markets than you have now. Now, in your perspective, what should be people's strategies when it comes to buying at this point? Because we have seen quite a bit of a fall right now. Some people are expecting uh, precious metals to fall lower, uh, but other people are saying, you know, take advantage of this dip here. So your perspective on that? Well, there's several ways to approach it. And the main thing is to have a plan and stick to your plan. It's if you have a plan of dollar cost averaging, for example, and I'm going to buy precious metals for the next three years, and I'm going to buy it at $100 a month for the next three years, stick to your plan. So when the metals get crashed, you're buying a lot more metal for that $100 than you are at price are high, but in a bull market, it's a good way to dollar cost average and get a good price over time and it takes a lot of stress. So that's number one. The other one, of course, is what people want to do, and that is to pick an exact bottom, which is nearly impossible. And the problem is the psychology that goes into it. When you say that's the bottom and you buy, 
And then you find out it's gone even lower than you're upset with yourself. You should have waited and you're hesitant to buy more. So strategy there, really, what I've done and it seems to work well is I make certain that the bottom is in. So let's say, for an example, silver bottoms at 1788 a week from Tuesday. And that's the low. And then it comes back up to and trades are below 19 for a matter of weeks. I would look at the chart and I would make silver prove itself to me, which means I'd say, okay, I draw a horizontal line that would say when silver gets above 1880, this is based on, you know, this is based on the future. And then when it above and when it gets above 1880, it has to stay there for three days in a row, it must be consecutive days, and it must be on higher than average volume. And if that occurs, then I can go ahead and buy silver. Well, David, you could have bought it at 1788. First of all, to think that you can buy it at that low is almost ridiculous because the way the futures market works is when it hit that theoretical price, that theoretical spike low, there might have been two or three futures contracts that were bought at that price, and then it starts to move up in the next bid offer spread is at uh, 18. And that's the way markets actually work. And because of that fact, you cannot get these, unless you just pure luck getting the low. So you want to buy within the, the buying range and you want to sell in the selling range. I would say right now, Elijah, anyone that's bought at a 28 or whatever, you know, you're feeling some pain. I understand that, but I think in the longer term, you're going to be fine. But if you're new or you want to average down, I would say anything under 20 in silver is a bargain. And again, you know, you asked me two months out. I think two months out, we will be in a position where uh, the metals prices look better. My only concern is that uh, two months out, we might see one more, you know, big move by the Fed. Maybe they're, they're fed up with themselves and they will raise interest rates, let's say 1%. If they did that, the market would react as it is now. Gold and silver would get hammered. You might see another big push down. But in either case, I don't see these push downs being long in duration. That's the whole point. And if your plan is, I'm happy buying under $20 silver. I know I'm being a little bit long-winded, but I'll just give you a real quick example. When we had the last big smash, March of 2020, I had plenty of cash on the sidelines. Now, I wasn't planning on the gold-silver ratio getting to 125. So I put a pretty substantial order in for physical silver the day before it hit the low of, I think, around $12. And I believe the day before it was somewhere around 14 When it went down another $2 or thereabouts, I called up my dealer and said... Well, if I'd waited till today, how much money would I have saved? And of course, on the paper market, it would have been $2, obviously. But in the physical market for 100 ounce bars, the one I had committed to, I'd only save about 35 cents. So that shows you that the premium basically reacts to these market conditions when you're dealing in the physical realm. And having said all that, you could have bought it on paper. I did that in the 2008 crisis. When the 2008 crisis hit and eBay was selling silver at $13 an ounce, I called up a friend that works in the uh, minting industry and I bought 1,000 ounce bars and had them minted into one half ounce rounds. In fact, I've shown them, I think, on your show before. So my net cost with the cost of the dye, the artwork, the transportation, and the labor turned it out to be uh, like $10 silver, but I have the Indian on the obverse and the Silver Dash Investor, my old website, on the reverse. And uh, it was a lot smarter to do that. I was thinking of selling them on my site, but I didn't really want to get the reputation as being a metals dealer because I'm not. I run a financial newsletter. So back to you. No, and I think that's so interesting, like the different strategies there. And also you mentioned like picking a bottom is it doesn't necessarily mean actually purchasing at the exact bottom. That's almost impossible, but waiting and getting in that general vicinity and waiting to show that there's strength to the upside and then purchasing is a very interesting strategy there. I did want to ask you about um, what we're hearing from the Fed because you know, it's, it is interesting how you know what the Fed does just impacts the markets so much right now, um, but we are hearing 
talk about a full percent rate hike uh, coming soon. Your perspective, if you could expand for our viewers what you see the Fed doing, because um, it seems like at least the narrative right now that they're pushing is we really need to get inflation under control, which I know it seems pretty much impossible right now, but your take on that. Yeah, I think it's a game of chicken. I think the Fed wants to certainly give the marks the impression that they're not giving up on the dollar. They have to raise interest rates because of the inflation problem in order for people to have faith in the dollar. And if they give up and do a reverse, a pivot, they start to lower interest rates, that signals to the entire world that the dollar is doomed. It's going in the dustbin of history fiat currency that preceded it. And that's what they don't want to have happen, although that's the most likely scenario to take place. So they're caught in a bind, a rock in a hard place, and they're getting squeezed. I do think that it's possible. Uh, just I want to add on to this. Bill Gross, um, well known as the bond king for, for a very long time, suggested that the Federal Reserve put the federal funds rate at 3.5% immediately, which would be almost two, two full points above where it is now. And, you know, would that help? And it may, there is just this fine line. Do you either inflate the problem away and make the money currency worthless, or do you actually get interest rates high enough where you crash the bond market? Now the yield curve gets changed so dramatically that those people that have a $1,000 face value on their bond now are only able to get $580 for it because they have to sell at a discount for that bond that's at 1% to yield the same amount as the current market rate. And that, of course, is really the most ethical thing to do. And it would say that the U.S. dollar is, is being saved and it actually has value and it can continue. I doubt that will be the case, uh, although I don't rule it out entirely. I'm probably one of the few analysts that will say that. I don't rule it out entirely. I mean, if you look at uh, the worst case scenario as far as pain is involved, um, that would be it. But it actually is a better solution than going the route of uh, Weimar Republic is Zimbabwe and Argentina, where the crisis is a currency crisis. And people don't have faith in the currency at all. And there's lots we could talk about. I mean, there's talk about the BRICS currency and there's talk about, you know, a, a gold back yuan and all these things, but they're all out there in the, in the thought process. Nothing definitive has been put or proposed other than a central bank digital currency, which is the same fiat fiasco, only with more control.